Good news, everyone. Let's get dangerous. This is so cool. I know. It feels so right. It's geek theory. Opening our minds to new ideas. Kill him. Who is that guy? Your mama. You just made the list. <laughs> oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even hard. It's all in fantasy. Pages of the rain. So what? We talk about it all the time. Really? No. Burn. What's up, you ducks? It is on Fantasy Tales of the Ranks, as you just heard. If you're watching later on YouTube, you're like, wait, that's not Chris Meany. That's right. It is the great Chris Harris. Still a Chris, but Chris Harris of Harris Football. Please, if you haven't already, which I don't know because I'm sure a lot of you found me from being on Chris Harris's podcast, but if you haven't, <laughs> At Harris Football, really easy to find them on YouTube as well because it's YouTube.com at Harris Football. And if you're not subscribed up to either one of those, please do five days a week as he does in the season, which I am a regular guest on and appreciative of. And that's why he's here today to talk week three rankings, similar to what we, he does on his show, uh, a little bit different like Meanie and I do a little bit more tongue in cheek, but this is kind of more his style, which I love doing because if you want some insight for somebody who watches every damn minute of every damn football game, pretty much, Chris Harris is the one you want to go to. Thank you for doing this, Chris. You got it. What a lovely intro. I appreciate the kind words. And uh, I forgot before we hit, hit hit record, I'm going to have to ask you to be on my show next week. But we'll get to that at some point. <laughs> when we're done. Well, stay tuned for that. If you love us yeah. together, we'll be back next week because I'm sure you're going to say yes, and we'll figure that out. All right, so as we dive into week three, as Chris knows and everybody out there, we have two weeks of information, very small sample, but we have a lot of injuries and a lot of situations that are already kind of throwing us for a loop heading into week three. So that's how we're going to attack this. And Chris, right off the gate, quarterbacks. We don't usually spend a lot of time on quarterbacks, uh, but I feel like there's two really interesting ones. Derek Carr and Baker Mayfield are one and two, yeah. just like we all predicted, Chris. We <laughs> all knew this was going to happen. They were going to be top 10 quarterbacks this year. Look, I, I said this to you in the show. She is like, our brains want to say like, this isn't, this isn't supposed to happen. This isn't supposed to be what it is. And this isn't going to happen for the rest of the year. But so far, if you knew, if you were sitting here in hindsight, you'd be saying, I should have started both of them both weeks over Anthony Richardson. Jaden Daniels is right there in the mix, but definitively over Joe Burrow over Dak Prescott. How do you parse out when you're looking at two weeks of what has changed one with the offense for the, uh, Saints with more pre-snap motion with Kubiak or Baker Mayfield just continuing his success from last year and say, like, do our brains kind of have to take a back seat as the results are here? I'm very amenable to the idea of changing the opinion, especially because there's such a knee jerk now to, uh, oh, does he run the quarterback? Run? Oh, then he's QB four, you know, <laughs> and um, that's, I think bad logic. Uh, and so the guys that these two dudes who aren't going to probably make their bones via the run are still overachieving and producing really great fantasy results. And so I have a tendency to want to say, I believe it and come on, let's go, let's ride them. I think the problem is it's these two particular players that we all have very long histories with and kind of know what's coming because just what they've been for the better part of a decade. I, I didn't have either one of uh, Carr or Mayfield in my top 10 for this week. And I did put some of those running guys who aren't as good a thrower ahead of them and didn't feel wonderful doing it. Cause you're right. If you're ranking based on results, you would put them one and two or five and eight or something like that. Um, m my thing is that eventually the inner Derek Carr usually does rear its head and I would need more than two games to be convinced. Otherwise it's looked really good, but they also have been way out ahead Derek Carr's biggest issue is when he has to stress and strain and chase on the scoreboard. It sometimes doesn't wind up looking so good. And Baker Mayfield is under a constant barrage of pressure. And as I'm calling him the pinball wizard this year, he's just bouncing <laughs> off sackers and somehow staying up. And, you know, his running is, is good. And like, he's a strong guy. And I sometimes think part of the reason Rashad White's been a good receiving back for a couple of years is because Mayfield like doesn't get sacked when anybody else would have, and then the defense forgets about everyone else and White's there for a dump off. The bottom line is, though, a long, long walk 
off a short pair, two weeks is not enough to convince me that these guys are different guys. I, and I think I'm with you on that. I, I ranked mostly because of the matchup this week, Carr in front of Mayfield and Carr just as a barely inside a QB one tier, a little bit more willing, I say, just because again, matchup, he's not facing the Broncos. Like I, I as, as we've seen so much of both that it's that brain where like, I know what I've seen, like you said, I need more than two weeks, which we'll kind of touch on some of these other things with, uh, with as well. And I wanted to move up one. I was originally going to kind of loop this in with wide receivers, but let's stick with the saints because it's basically, we'd be coming, we'd circling the wagon and coming back on this anyway. Rashid Shahid, we might as well talk yeah. about him. Uh, everybody wants to know, is he the breakout of 2024? Obviously, again, you go back to Kubiak and being able to change this offense and has done wonders through two games. It is through two games. Shahid, similar use to Chris Olave in targets and all that type of stuff. But at the same time, if you actually look at it, okay, the use is there, but we're still only talking about a handful. And I'm of the opinion, and we'll see if you agree, Chris, is it feels more like the good Gabe Davis, like not the bad one from last year, like the two years ago, Gabe Davis, where it's like, you know what? He's a wide receiver three, and I'm going to have to keep him in my lineup every single week because this isn't going to continue, but we're still going to get good games. You just have to know the downfall is going to come partly because of Carr, but also because it's not like he's seeing eight, nine, 10 targets a game. It's all fair. Boy, I wouldn't compare them at all as players, but it is fair yes. that he belongs in the feast or famine category for the moment. Maybe not, though. Like, maybe he'll... There was a time where people thought that about Tyreek Hill and sometimes really fast players turn into something else. Um, the magic with Rashid Jaheed, especially compared to someone like Gabe Davis, is that, I mean, Derek Carr has done interviews for Monday Night Football where he said, like, we have a thing. Me and Rashid have a thing where if, if he sees that he has no safeties on his side, he's allowed to turn any route into a go yeah. because he's the fastest guy in the field. So the fact that that's there as a possibility in any given week isn't there for Gabe Davis, isn't there for a lot of right. guys. So right. there is a built-in ceiling of a week-winning 70-yard touchdown, which he's done twice now, once a week. It's probably not going to do that every week, but <laughs> at least it's there. And it was there last year. The difference, so I, I mean, I wrote about Shahid this summer, and I said I wanted to be more excited about him because he really is like game-breakingly fast, and I was kind of early on him last year, and it just you know, be a great feather in my cap. Well, let's face it. The feathers in my cap are really all that matters here. Uh, like I would have loved to have come away from rewatching his 2023 film and thought, wow, this dude is absolutely going to bust out. But he really was running a very limited route tree last year. It was, it was the go. It was the stop. It was the dig. And that was kind of it. And if he was running other routes, they weren't throwing it to him on those routes. And I don't know that he's like become Devontae Adams here footwork wise, but there's obviously more of an, an incentive or uh, motivation or whatever to get him the ball in variety of ways. And that's probably just can be chalked up to the overall creativity of the offense because Pete Carmichael was just not very creative. Um, <laughs> and so like, to say the least. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're, you know, it's not eight or nine targets, but it's six. And when it's five or six and it's, a really fast guy who you know, he gets jet sweeps and he gets screens and he gets crossers. And like, I'm starting to become a little bit more of a believer. Um, you're right though. You would need the saints offense to really become a wagon to be, to put Rashid Jade in the position that you would put. I mean, T Higgins two years ago, Devonte Smith two years ago, and this year, right. uh, Jalen Waddle two years ago. The second receiver, you know, you need the you need the environment to be unbelievable because the counter argument is always too many mouths to feed, mm. and yeah. like I'm never worried about too many mouths to feed if the offense is really really good. I'm not like totally sold. The Saints' offense is really really good. See also Derek Carr. <laughs> See, also, Derek, I, I generally agree with you there. So I want to find out how you feel about this next person to come back to the Anthony Richardson conversation. And I like a lot of people, I do it tongue in cheek. So people think I'm serious. A lot of times I'm not victory lapping this one. I'm truly not. But I'm, I'm actually presenting that because a lot of times I'm saying this is coming from somebody who was because a lot of times if you come from Rose or whatever the opposite of Rose color glasses are, you're going to already have your opinion and whether it's confirmation bias or whatever. So 
This is coming from somebody who was down on Michael Pittman this year. I mm. had him as a wide receiver three because I said Anthony Richardson offense isn't going to be throwing 550 times. I was concerned at the time of Josh Downs, and then with Adonai Mitchell kind of stepping into that role, I thought he might just take the Downs role. And I wasn't even expecting Alec Pierce to be Alec Pierce. But I'm saying that to all say is I wasn't expecting it to be this bad. Like so mm. far through only two weeks, he's wide receiver five, six territory. It is as bad as people can think. So I, I want to kind of phrase it. I'm kind of, it's a, almost a, like a loaded question for you, Chris, but you'll see where I'm going with this is like, was my concern warranted, but it should be worse. Or is this just, you know what? This is a rough first two weeks. Anthony Richardson looked terrible in week two and it's going to get better Maybe we don't panic. Um, this just in: Anthony Richardson looked terrible in week one. Also, uh, <laughs> it was truly it was tr terrible in week two. <laughs> uh, he was truly terrible in week one. There okay, wasn't any okay. difference. The difference was the two bombs that were completed and True. like great athletic play. But um, I don't know that that repeatable. Uh, Alec Pierce to me is not a factor. He's just, the touchdown comes in Green Bay last week, like in totally emergency mode. It kind of could have been anybody. The Packers had played, were playing way off. They were up multiple scores. I'm just not that excited about, about Pierce. Um, I'm worried about every Colts pass catcher because Anthony Richardson's been bad, 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 terrible. Um, I, I posted something on Twitter yesterday about the, the uh, highest percentage of off target throws and Caleb Williams is worst. Bryce Young was second worst. Anthony Richardson was third worst. He's not a NFL level thrower right now for his own fantasy value obviously there's mitigating factors we can you and i are kind of tend to be on the same side of this debate but we can argue with people about how much that factor should make you want anthony Richardson on a team i'm always of the notion that the pure running quarterback who can't throw eventually bites you and isn't that great but the, you know you can clearly get some peaks but yeah i think every colts receiver Anybody who has stock in any Colts receiver should be worried right now. And Michael Pittman is a Colts receiver, so therefore I am worried. Um, but it's not about his place in the offense. It's not about some 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 innate thing inside of Anthony Richardson that makes him unable to throw possession. It's nothing. It's just he can't throw. He's just not good <laughs> right now. There's there's a big problem. And and this isn't to say he'll never be able to throw. Greg Olson did that game, the Green Bay uh, Indianapolis game. He said how much Anthony Richardson reminds him of Cam Newton. He should know. He got traded from Chicago to yeah. Carolina, Cam Newton's rookie year, and lived through the entire experience. Saw him go from this sort of player who was kind of a disaster as a rookie, but like tantalizing, to league MVP. So it isn't to say Richardson can't get better, but he as a core as a thrower right now, Indianapolis has a problem. Mm, definitely agree. All right, so then let's move to running back here for a minute. And watching that Browns game, uh, so most people watching, they're like, oh, my God, what the hell is happening? Like, Deonta Foreman gets the start. They go yeah. full-blown committee. Now, Pierre Strong got hurt, so he's kind of eliminated from this equation. But watching that, too, it seemed this is kind of like, well, we know what Jerome Ford can do, and he can't seem to run between the tackles. So let's just take the guy who can. And if you watched on video, I kind of did a lot of half quotes because I don't think Deonta Foreman is that good. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have a different, okay. So you're shaking your head. No, but it's enough to say if this is going to be their game plan, if we're just going to slam Foreman up the gut and then play for Ford in the other role, which as you saw on a per touch basis, he has that big playability and they kind of used him in that facet, which at the same time makes me go back and like, okay, Browns, you're just going to be telegraphing half of your play calls anyway. But anyway, that's a sidebar. The Foreman Ford situation, I guess the real question I have for you is, are you seeing it the same? Because if it's anybody I want to talk film with, it's you. And that's kind of where I went with the Foreman Ford and facing the Giants. It's like, well, I guess I'm going to rank Foreman just barely higher than Ford. But now I'm just completely annoyed. <laughs> yeah, that's how I ranked it, too. I think like 28 Foreman among running backs, 31 Ford among running right, backs. Same. The... um you know, the per touch thing for Ford is even worse when you realize that the one big play was a fourth down where mm -hmm. uh, Jameis Winston was in and the Jags were all, you know, trying to w stop, stop the quarterback sneak and they surprised him and he went around the left edge and ran for whatever, 40 yards. So like take that play away and it's really bleak for Ford. And uh, like, I think you have to base your opinion on the most recent thing that you've seen. 
And the most recent thing we saw was a surprise. They weren't telling us beforehand that Deontay Foreman is, is our starting running back and we're going to mix and match, but it's going to be Foreman in most what you think of traditional running back situations. But let's acknowledge they didn't do that week one. And so maybe it was a team specific game plan. It's hard to know, but all that makes it less enticing to use any of them. I, it, it just would be, it's a stretch. You don't want to, when, when there are this, when there are no teams on by and there are this many receivers active in any given week, once you get down to 28, 31, 34 among running backs, I don't want to flex any of them. If I can avoid it, I got to have a receiver with more upside than the doofuses down there at 30 among running back. So yeah, as much as I think you're right, you'd be in a position to know that the giants are a pretty good matchup for an opposing running. We'd love to take advantage of that matchup, but I don't know outside of a desperate circumstance uh, in a very deep league. I don't know that I feel good about either guy. Well, then let's stick with the Browns and talk about not feeling good about their wide receiver, Amari Cooper, 17 well, yeah. targets for nothing, essentially. It's just, I mean, there's no point even breaking it down. Five receptions, I think it was 20, or was it 15 for five for seven, 27? It's miserable, whatever it is. It's as bad as you can get for somebody that's the lead wide receiver. Uh, also in quotes, if no, if you're just listening on the podcast, but it's kind of like the Pittman conversation where you know, it's tough to talk about it, like for mine, because everybody thinks I have this jaded view is like, I didn't want Cooper any of my teams this year because I saw a Deshaun Watson problem. Again, I didn't expect it to be this bad where it's now been so bad that people are asking if they should drop Cooper. And I'm like, if that's the case, you know, I'll throw you a random bench running back. If you're just going to drop them to get the rights to stash Cooper on my bench. Is there any hope here? I mean, the targets are still there and it's a good matchup with the Giants. But I mean, is this just a Deshaun Watson problem that similar to Anthony Richardson? It's just not going to go away unless the quarterback changes. Yeah, it's that's exactly what it is. I, I ranked Pittman and Cooper right next to each other this week outside my top 40 wide receivers. Nice. And I ranked actually Judy just a few spots ahead of both of them because he was a little more productive and he didn't have he a whole drop. <laughs> I, C- Cooper had a drop that you just go, wow. I mean, he does that. No question. Amari Cooper does two things. He, he like has unbelievably great catches combined with incredible head clutching drops. And then he's going to get hurt like once every two games, but like muscle through and soldier through, like he never comes out, but like he'll, he'll limp off. Um, it's a Deshaun Watson problem. It absolutely is. There was one, really good big boy Deshaun Watson throw in the second half when they needed it. And it was like a, a deep, I don't, I think it was kind of a deep out. It wasn't really an over, but it wasn't like a pure out it was sort of a sale maybe. And uh, a la- beautiful layered throw where uh, it's over the, the, it's basically the throw you expect from his Texans days. The thing he did all the time as a Texan, <laughs> but it's just was surrounded by more crap. It was surrounded by just more awful play. I, I agree with you. I, Cooper and Judy are probably both too good of players to be dropped, but there's absolutely no reason to start them. I would probably just say, okay, let's just let them ride bench for a little while longer. You know, people who are trying to drop their their fifth round or sixth round pick two games in, are you new to fantasy? Like, are you are you aware <laughs> that this? Like, things do turn around. I think that the teams as constituted now will change, and there'll be a lot of different perceptions as we go forward. All right, well, that's a great transition you just gave me because so far through two games, Ramondre Stevenson is a bell cow. And even properly, if you told people this heading into week three before the season, hey, Ramondre Stevenson's going to be a bell cow. And they'd be like, oh, well, then he's got 13 receptions through two games, right? They'd be like, no, <laughs> that's not what's happening. Yeah. They're bell cowing him in the run game. And Antonio Gibson's is the factor in the passing game. Yeah. I'm going to phrase this a specific way for you, Chris. It's the Patriots. We all expect this to stop working, don't we? And I'm going to to let you answer it that way as I phrase it. (laughs) I mean, not necessarily. No, they look okay. They look okay. They're, they're, they're not a good team, but they're not a horrible team. Like it's a great lesson when you say before the games start, I'm positive, which offenses are going to be unusable. I mean, we're just not. You know, draft good players. That's my philosophy. And Ronda Stevens is a good player. Um, I think there are people in New England who think the pass game should flow more through Antonio Gibson. Like there were plays against the Seahawks on Sunday where it was Gibson wasn't on the field. Stevenson was split wide. They threw him a couple of like wide receiver screen type type plays. One of them counted as a run because it was a backwards pass. Yeah. Um, 
he's he's been really good and you know the if if you had polled everybody in the NFL and said which offensive line is going to be the biggest problem uh yeah. this season people would have said patriots by a mile and they are having a real problem pass blocking they really have not them and chicago are the two that on film that stand out as like Oh, you're just like uh, Andy Barron's was on my show today, and he said um, they're having a hard time even frisking the guys as they go by. I was like, that's pretty, pretty good description. Um, like, and the Pats have that problem for sure in terms of pass blocking, but run blocking. I mean, it may have something to do. Maybe the Bengals and Seahawks are are easy to run against. The Jets have been pretty easy to run against so far. We'll see on Thursday night. Uh, so maybe it'll turn out that that's fool's gold too. But man, Ramondre has had a lot of room to run, has made a lot of guys miss, has accumulated a lot of yards after contact. I I think he's an RB too. Um, Jim McCormick came on my show on Friday and I listed Ramondre as my number one player after one game that I had already changed my opinion on for exactly the reasons that you said in introducing him. Like I just, yeah, I was, I think he's good, but I was worried about the situation. And if the situation turns out more neutral than horrible, um, I think he's an RB too. Okay. Well, then let's see if you feel this player is an RB2. Now, on the one hand, it feels great to root for this running back as I set him up. Uh, I I don't remember if you and I have ever talked about J.K. Dobbins, uh, so I'll be interested mm. in your opinion of him as a whole as well, because he's somebody to go back to his draft class when I do tiers for rookies. He was in tier one talent-wise. Like, I believed in the talent. Again, I, I want to hear if you always thought that as well, because that's part of the equation. Um, so we've always wanted him to see him healthy, and he's healthy. He's still splitting quite a bit with Gus Edwards, but definitively looks better through two games. The matchup is going to be telling this week. It's a tough one. I'm going to get a real tell of like what their style is and like if they're going to lean more to him or they're going to keep the 50-50. So that's something we're going to have to see, and you can't really answer that. But you can at least answer that. Do you feel he's in the RB2 conversation? Do you believe in the talent and that as he's close to 100% of whatever estimation we can give it, that we should be back in on J.K. Dobbins? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have him, I think, at 20 among running backs this week, and that's okay. low because the Steelers' matchup is hard. He probably should be higher than that based on based on the Chargers' offensive line looking like they've really put something together. He's had some really big lanes to run through as well. Everybody's going to tell you, well, the run and pass mix. I mean, they, they just, obviously they want to run. Well, yeah, they want to run when they're winning by three touchdowns, which has happened <laughs> you know, twice in a row. So I grant you that that would be their preferred way. Uh, to go. Um, but he, he himself has looked really good. I don't think he's ever going to be what you saw when you thought he was a top one talent because right, of the right. injuries. Like we've seen him get run down from behind on multiple long, long runs where, uh, you know, I just think maybe the very top end speed isn't there the way it was when he first came out, but he actually did have a long touchdown against Carolina where I think it was like long. It was like 35 yards. So it was long enough to get in the clear, but not long enough to get run down on like a 70 yard run. But um, he's like, if people have a hesitation of using him against the Steelers, we understand these two teams seem like they prefer to kind of be in a rock fight. And maybe there aren't a ton of points out there, scoreboard points out there for, for anybody. And then, eventually Gus Edwards clearly going to score some one yard touchdowns and we're going to get annoyed. Like that's just going to happen. But, um, the, your hesitation in drafting Dobbins was always how long could it possibly last two weeks in is lasted two weeks. So like, I would yeah. just go, yeah, I'm going to run it back until he gets hurt again. And if he never gets hurt, then I got an awesome value. I don't need the chargers to make a decision and and not make it 50 50 like and it's really not 50 50 it's it's definitely yes. lean it leans towards dobbins for sure but i don't need it to be 80 percent dobbins for him to keep being okay. in fantasy lineups okay well certainly don't feel good about this next running back and it's interesting that you had andy barons on because we're going to talk about his team we just talked about it uh not even frisking as he said and <laughs> we've seen how caleb williams looks in this offense you talk about as bad as things can get and people are even making the comparison to bryce young which is how bad it's been through two games part of that's also been i think most people assume there would be some drop off from swift going from the eagles to the bears but again, another one where I don't think anybody also expected it to be this bad. The weird thing about it 
is watching these games. Uh, I don't know how you feel, but I continue to sit there semi baffled as somebody who likes Khalil Herbert. And I say that like with you could hear that inflection is like, I like him. I kind of mm-hmm. like him more than most people did, but I'm still not like, oh, Khalil Herbert's a top 20 talent. I'm never saying that. And yet I'm like, why is he out there <laughs> getting the third down touches instead of DeAndre Swift is like it. Is DeAndre Swift just not good? And so I'm kind of phrasing it that way for you. Like, where do you have him in your rankings? Because this feels like the get right matchup. But mm. at the same time, Swift has looked anything. You, this is one of the ones I usually say, Chris, on my podcast is strip the name off the jersey. And nobody wants anything to do with him in fantasy at all. Who, Swift? Yes. Strip his name Swift. off? Yes. If, 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 if he was, if he was, De, if, he, if he was Deon, De, DeAndre Higginbotham, people would be oh. like, don't, don't even care about him in fantasy. It's only because they know who he is. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, yeah, not only not only does Herbert sometimes come in and play third downs, but uh, he came in and stole the one yard touchdown. Yeah, against Houston. So like, yeah, that's a it's a problem. Um, I where did I rank him? I ranked him twenty nineteen. I think right ahead of Dobbins, maybe uh, for this week because man, the Colts oof, <laughs> they really can't stop anybody on the ground so far. Um, I think it's time maybe we as a society should should come to grips with. DeAndre Swift and what the NFL thinks of him. How many years are we going to do this? Where we go, oh, well, now he's got this new <laughs> coaching staff and that new team. Clearly, these guys are going to believe in him all the way. Like, I think we're through three teams and like five coaching staffs who haven't believed, maybe four coaching staffs that haven't believed in him all the way. Um, it's not going to happen. It, it's he's he, He's not trustworthy in pass protection. He's like... He just seems like he should be a great receiver and never really has been. Um, he's a good player, but he's not like a transcendent player. And the entire Bears environment is being, it's not his fault. He's a passenger. And maybe people were thinking, wow, he's not, he's going to be a driver, not a passenger. And uh, have you met DeAndre Swift? You know, it's just, he's a passenger. <laughs> and like the, the, the bus that he's a passenger of is, being driven by somebody who doesn't have a license. You know, it's just, it's a rough offensive environment because hard knocks, notwithstanding and all the free agent guys, notwithstanding and the drafting of Romo Dunze, notwithstanding Caleb Williams, isn't ready. I mean, I think I, 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 I don't know if I quoted the Anthony Richardson stat, right. But I, Caleb Williams is like second worst, third worst. No, he's yeah, the worst. Caleb is worst. 29%. Yep. That's right. 29% of his throws uh, so far this year have been judged to be off target. These are not drops. These are off target throws, which doesn't always mean that, you know, I tried to throw it to you standing right there and I missed, but like, I didn't know which the play was and I didn't know where to throw it. And like, he's just been <laughs> awful. He's been bad and it's, it's hurting the bears for sure. And I mean, I ranked DJ Moore outside the top 20 receivers. Do you know how bad a quarterback situation has to be for me to rank DJ Moore outside the top 20? Like that is, that is a <laughs> penurious rank as they say. Um, Swift is not going to be a lead back ever in the NFL in, in any sort of Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley sort of it's just never ever going to happen and the faster we come to grips with it, it as a society Jake how are you doing coping with this information are you okay <laughs> I I am actually doing okay because I have zero of DeAndre Swift Me too. because yeah it, it was it was kind of the, what you're saying here baked into all of it is just understanding who Swift was and the Eagles got the best out of him um, if you're just joining us uh, or skip through the podcast or looking through the timestamps as a reminder, it's Chris Harris at Harris Football. Make sure you listen to his podcast five days a week and over on the YouTube channel, too. It's at, Chris, at Harris Football at, at YouTube as well. One of the best, as you can tell so far. But if you're just like jumping through and just getting to this point, if you missed it, yes, he is one of the best in the business talking mm-hmm. film and talking to these players for this week. Look, this one's very easy. We know there's a drop off from Tua. Tagovailoa to Skylar Thompson. No question about mm-hmm. it. Actually, if you also want to talk about off-target percentage, go look up Skylar Thompson. Very small sample, but also a very small sample of passes just going nowhere where he intends to throw them or should intend to throw them is probably the better way to put it. But at the same time, it's Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. So it's kind of this fantasy mind game we have to play with ourselves. Like We know we're starting Tyreek Hill, but when you have a quarterback drop off this far, is there a conversation to be had 
with Jalen Waddell because it's not that Justin Jefferson, he is clearly the alpha in Justin Jefferson. It's not Jamar Chase. He's clearly the alpha in Jamar Chase. This is, he's the number two, and we've seen Jalen Waddell have some of his own inconsistencies. Yeah, it's very, it's very arguable. Sight unseen, Skylar Thompson unseen, you know, to, to give Waddle a rest. Um, of course, he's a very fast player and a very good player, and all it takes is one play. And that's, that's what gets him ranked. You know, that's what gets him. He's outside my top 30, which is a lot lower than he would normally be if Tua was I think there. It's fair. Um, but he still needs to be ranked because he's an, a really, really talented, ridiculously talented, got his second contract player. This is not a bad player at all. He's just not Tyree Kill. Um, if you woke up on Monday and it turned out in this game against Seattle that Waddle is the one who scored the long touchdown and Hill did nothing, no one is going to be like, you know, that's impossible. How did that happen? Like, this is the nature of scoring with Skylar Thompson. That's actually the name, the new name of my new podcast, a little side, <laughs> side hustle, scoring with Skylar Thompson. Uh, it's a really short, really short podcast. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, the uh, it, it all is going to if work badly. Let's get to Tyler Huntley. You know, I'd, I'd prefer it be Tyler Huntley. Not that I think that's going to go great, but I probably actually do have more confidence that the offense would function better. Once yeah. Tyler Huntley knows the playbook, um, it's it's. I, I think you have to start Hill. I think you have to start HN, and I think otherwise you don't have to start anybody because why borrow trouble? Mm, definitely. All right. So somebody that I have zero shares of, uh, although through the I, for week two specifically, looked like hey, you're dumb. You should have had some shares. It's Malik Neighbors of the Giants, and it only mm. had to do with the fact that Malik Neighbors cost was top 15, top 20 at worst. And the comparison I kept throwing out, Chris, was just because everybody would say, well, he's just going to get so many targets and so many targets and so many targets. And if you push back with Daniel Jones, people seem to not want to accept that it's Daniel Jones, but but so many targets. So my Hmm. pushback was always, why receiver 18 in fantasy points per game last year was Devontae Adams on 175 targets. By the way, also had eight touchdowns. I don't think Neighbors is getting 175. And even if he did... I don't think he's getting the eight touchdowns from Daniel Jones, which was always my counter argument. Again, looking at week two, people are going to be like, ha ha, you're dumb. <laughs> but the question here really truly is, can Malik Neighbors with what probably looks like it's going to be historic target volume, even coming from Daniel Jones, be somebody that I'm not going to put you and be like, oh, Chris, tell me he's going to be top 20. I just want to know, does Chris Harris feel like, Malik Neighbors needs to be in my lineup every single week. I don't care if he's facing the Browns, Steelers, or if he's facing the Panthers. Good or bad, I'm starting Malik Neighbors. Uh, I mean, fortunately, I don't have to make that decision. I don't have to make the week eight decision in week three. (laughs) Right. So for week three, I think he needs to be in your lineup. Coming off what he's coming off of, I think he needs to be in your lineup. Yes. Um, Would I, if I were redrafting right now, would I take Malik Neighbors as wide receiver 17? I don't think I would. Okay. Uh, because of the Daniel Jones factor. He looks great. He looks good. We, you know, there's a, there's always a X percent chance that it's just a blow that it's Kyle Pitts, that it's just, yeah, you spent the high pick and it, he just wasn't good. It just t- turned out you, you misevaluate the player. So that's swept away. My link neighbors is good. He doesn't look out of place in an NFL field. That's great right away. So, so like some nervousness that I had about him in drafts that because rookies always just get too much hype that's gone away a little bit of that nervousness but it's still Daniel Jones on an offense I don't think scores a lot of points and you know games where they don't play the commanders probably don't have as (laughs) easy a time moving the ball um so it's it's pretty easy for me to hold those two thoughts in my head at the same time which is I, I week three why would I rock the boat and bench him coming off of this crazy game where I mean, they ran every kind of route they could think of for this dude. They tried throwing it deep and that didn't work at all. Jones essentially threw it out of bounds every time he tried to throw it deep to neighbors. Um, and then they, they ran crossers and stops and screens and comebacks and digs and, you know, corners and everything. And he caught a lot of them and didn't catch a lot of them. And like, I probably don't want to bet into that in week three, but if he go, if Jones goes out and gets, sacked eight times which is on the table sorry giants fan uh <laughs> it is on the table um and then and neighbors winds up with three catches am i allowed to then revisit in week four and go okay 
it's the, you know, that ride isn't smooth. Like he's part of the infinite sadness of wide receiver threes. He just is. It's just that he's coming off an awesome game and he's a fun talent with a great career upside. So we want to pretend like we can make some proclamation about his entire rookie stock. And I just don't think we can. All right, then two more. And you brought up Kyle Pitts. That's going to be involved in the last question today. But right before we get to him, we talk about off target, talk about awful quarterback play and the Bryce Young as an NFL quarterback. This that's a whole side conversation. That's not what we're here to talk about for fantasy purposes. The way I'll phrase this easily for you, Chris, is people just want to say Bryce Young's not under center. Andy Dalton is. He barely throws off target. Everything's better. Deontay Johnson. Yay. He lives. Is it really that simple? I, I'm not from the future, so I can't tell you <laughs> yes, one way or the other. It gives me more hope than it would have had Bryce Young stayed in that job for Deontay Johnson, and I did rank him higher than I would have. I might not have put Deontay Johnson in my top 50 if Bryce Young had stayed. Um, and so, and so I think this week he... Did he make your my, top 40? Yeah, no, he's 30-something, 30 33 30 okay. or something okay. like that. So, But like, think about how insane that is. To think that, oh, well, thank heavens, Andy Dalton, the guy who clearly <laughs> so many times has delivered excess value over replacement level quarterback, let alone Andy Dalton, who hasn't played in two years, let alone Andy Dalton towards the end of his career, let alone, you know, the, I just, how many times have I relied on the red pop gun to come in and <laughs> rescue me? You know, it's not, not what I want. Oh, you downgraded him from the red rifle. I love it. Yeah, he is the red <laughs> pop gun. Um, like, I. I, I, but and yet, of course, there's a, it's it's very simplistic dot connecting that says, give me, give me, give me. I said this on my show today. If you could lock me into the twenty third best quarterback performance of week three, I'll take my chances, baby. Because I was looking <laughs> at thirty one or thirty two. You know, it was either it was either Bryce Young or Bo Nix. Congratulations, Bo Nix. You now are the worst quarterback in the league. Um, <laughs> Like, I yeah, I, I'm interested to know whether this coaching staff, this pretty new team with a lot of totally new pieces or whatever, could could it all function better with the 23rd best quarterback performance as opposed to the 31st? It, it might. And it's enough to make me go, you know what? I don't want to use them. But if you tell me Deontay Johnson or Deontay Foreman, I'm going to start Deontay Johnson. You know, <laughs> go, to to call back our our previous conversation, I'd yeah. rather take a chance on the receiver than the the scrubby, kind of not great situationy. You know, like halftime running back in a, in a flex type spot. I mean, Dante Johnson gets open right away. Like he gets open. The problem was that Bryce Young is so lost yeah. in a Mac Jones sort of way that he just couldn't hit an open receiver. Um, and poor Deontay Johnson, like he's had Kenny Pickett in his recent past, and now and now this. And now he gets well, at least he gets Andy Dalton now, right? So, oh my God! Yeah, I mean, a, yeah, it's not good when Andy Dalton well, is your is your savior. That's not not good. At, at least he'll he'll get it to him while he's open. That's the good thing. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Real quickly on that with the Bryce Young, I talked about um the recap. I did a quick pod after the weekend. And I was like, the biggest thing is like, you know what? Bryce Young is actually extending plays. The problem is when he does, it's there's no reset to his game. It's like it's watching some kid on a playground just wing it this is the conor mcgregor gif we've all seen he's just flailing out there and that's why it's not even getting close to him all right so before we get out of here what a surprise we say this every year here i i'm laughing because i said this to chris meany yesterday he's like he's like you chris meany said to me before the season he's like tight end is deep this year and i just laughed he's like why are you <laughs> laughing and i was like because we say it every damn every year and it like year. and it never is Here's the problem, Chris. I don't think anybody, even if you said, yes, it's not going to be deep this year, that Travis Kelsey, Sam Laporte, and Kyle Pitts are going to be part of the problem. But through two weeks, Travis Kelsey, Sam Laporte, and Kyle Pitts are part of the problem. Would you buy low on any of the all three? Do you think all three can turn things around? Is there one that you think is the biggest outlier? What do you think of basically this collection? There were essentially three of the top four tight ends off the board this year. Kyle Pitts is not a good player and people should not be <laughs> buying him. And I'm sorry. Like if his name was Devonte Parker, you would know who he was because he's Devonte Parker. Um, <laughs> maybe there's some future where he becomes Vernon Davis because Vernon Davis went through this early in his career was a top five pick a good was a back, bust yeah. uh, and, and turned it around and became an all pro amazing player. So I can't say it, but I, I so like, what does, 
what lurks at the potential core of Kyle Pitts. Nobody knows that, but Kyle Pitts. But as far as what we've seen on the film for four years, he's just not that good. Troy Aikman on the broadcast Monday night is doing his best gamely to try to praise his blocking. You know, they, they really, they really want to have Kyle Pitts learn how to block, become a more complete tight end. He did a pretty good job there. Like, Oh boy, you're really, I mean, bless your heart, but you are really trying hard to uh, find something nice to say about Kyle Pitts. No, the answer on Kyle Pitts is I would not buy uh, the Kelsey and Laporta. Sure. But I don't care that much. I, 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 I think I can not spend resources. I mean, if you get him for nothing, that's fine. But I don't think anybody's sure. trading you Sam Laporta for Deontay Foreman. You know, right. like you're you're gonna have to give something up. And I would just rather we'll figure it out. It's a terrible, stupid position, and there will be a couple of guys that are good enough that you can muddle through your regular season, and then you'll hope you catch lightning in a bottle in December, and nobody can tell you who that guy is going to be in December. Maybe it's Laporta in December, but. Nobody can tell can, you. Can I tack on real quick on the Kelsey? Sure. I want to ask you, because again, somebody I respect more than most when it comes to watching games with how much you do. Um, so when I said to Meany was that Travis, Kel let's talk about Travis Kelsey. I, I said, and I'll explain it for everybody out there in case you didn't hear. I think he has a rice and worthy problem. And why I say I, he has a rice and worthy problem is because at this stage of his career, Kelsey is not somebody you want going to the boundaries is you want going deep. It's just, that's not part of his game. Rice is, is commanding so much of where Kelsey can do his things that the worthy problem, how this ties in is that I think they need worthy to become what Marquise Brown was supposed to become and get that secondary deeper, get that, like get teams to start running more too deep, get secondaries to pull off a little bit. So Kelsey can do what he has to do at this stage of his career. Do you think that's a fair assessment? And to say that, you know what, maybe you say, of course, nobody's going to give him away for nothing, but if I'm patient enough and it, two, three, four more weeks, and maybe this can turn the corner as worthy becomes the answer. I'm um, sure. Yeah. Kelsey's here, here's my honest truth is that Kelsey okay. was crap for fantasy last year too. And then, <laughs> and then they, they were like, all right, now it counts. You know, this is, this is, you know, I, I've been, I'm a Patriot fan. I've been through this where the regular season stops holding a lot of mystery for the team. And they're right. kind of just like, can we, can we, are we, can we get to the, uh, you know, are we done with the regular season yet? And then Kelsey would be like, oh, I'm good again. It turns out I'm really great. And I just didn't want to get murdered. Um, I, th you know, so I, I think he'll be fine. I think he'll be a top five tight end by the end of the year. He just won't be so far ahead of everyone else that people were taking him in the first round, which was always stupid uh, in fantasy. Uh, as far as usage goes, you know, there's there's there were plays in the field. There's the long one uh, in I can't remember which game it was. Was it? It was the first game where Wait. he okay. yeah, made a huge, huge long play and then like faked that he was going to throw the backwards pass. Yep. And like that would have been 80 yards or 70 yards or something. And it got called back by penalty. There was the fat guy touchdown on Sunday where he's <laughs> wide open. Kelsey's wide open, but they're like, this is funny. Let's throw it to the tackle or else Kelsey would have scored a touchdown. Like he'll be fine. He'll just be fine in the context of what tight end is, which is big slot receiver. And this just in. Big slot receivers aren't that reliable. Uh, I hate, hate to tell you, like it just isn't. People were saying, well, you have to have one of these six tight ends or else you're you're at a huge disadvantage. Like, nope, it's not a position <laughs> in the NFL anymore. If they're big <laughs> slot receivers or they're not, it's not a position and there's no emphasis on it. And I'm sorry, like, it's just, I wouldn't be spending much capital on it. You're not wrong. It's not too dis I mean, at least they run outside the whereas the fullback is almost completely gone. I think one team still uses at this point yeah. occasionally. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I definitely agree. And uh, you should agree with me on this. Make sure you are following Chris Harris at Harris Football podcast five days a week. YouTube channel at Harris Football. If you haven't been able to see through this podcast, one of the best minds out there. I, and I always love talking football with him. And I'll be on his show apparently at some point in the near future. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for having me, Jake. It was really, really fun. And uh, I, when you come on my show, I'm always like, okay, I'm no, I talk too much, but I'm going to try to let Jake talk more. What a pleasure to finally just, just completely athlete, like... <laughs> elbow you out and, and be able to just like ramble. It was so, so great. It's nice to be on the other side and uh, <laughs> we'll be back. Uh, I'll have the weekend heads up mailbag and then the recap and then back next week. So enjoy the, re good luck everybody in week three. Hopefully you have a tight end. That's a value. <laughs>